Father, does anyone have anything that they want to bring bring to session or bring up this morning? Is the springboard for discussion? I just had a really intense dream last night. Uh, it was all about the desire for a mate, that ideal mate. Leah <laughs> was in the dream last night. And, um, but it seemed clear that it wasn't <coughs> even so much about a, wanting a physical mate as just wanting that somebody that like wants you as much as you want them kind of thing and um, the whole feeling of completion because of that. In a sense of someone that would want to be with you as much as you want to be with them. Yeah. And I can see the fallacy of, you know, how, how um, human relationships don't achieve that, but there's still that intense yearning, and I was just really getting in touch with that yearning. make that observation because it's even in subtle forms like that whether you just think of it in terms of more along the lines of just companionship than necessarily a sexual attraction or some of the other things but even companionship you know is is an ego motivation still companionship still has those elements of, of wanting another body just to be there, just to be able to talk to, just to, at times it's not even the talk, it's just the sense of being with someone else in body. And it still involves the idea of relationships and involving bodies instead of a pure mind relationship. And so when you talk about it as an intense yearning, that, that is I mean, that's getting more to the heart of the ego, that intense yearning, because the ego is continually telling the mind, you must seek outside yourself to complete yourself. It is a sense, like you use the word completion, it is a real sense of that where the thrust of that yearning comes from is this deep, deep feeling of incompletion and so much wanting to be complete. And... You know, in the Beyond All Idols section, Jesus says, what you are asking for, you have every right to ask for. Completion is your inheritance. It's just that you're asking in the wrong place, kind of like you're still thinking of completion. You believe that completion lies outside yourself on the screen. So, like you're saying, even the sense of a companionship or just someone to be there with you is still a form of that. And we've talked about it other times as, as the ego's most special love relationship is the ego's most boasted gift and and I've called it a, other times kind of like the ace card for the ego. It's the yearning seems to be at times strongest in those respects. I mean there seems to be at other times yearnings for specific things. But this one seems to be more the one that the mind believes is Kind of the end all. If I could just have that, <laughs> life would be bearable. <laughs> Everything else, if I had that one. And the teachings that we keep going into is that that's that's another trick. I mean, people who have tried to play that out, they find what they think is the ideal companion, even, and of course. It's not, there isn't that sense of completion. There is no 
it's not like they come to the end of the rainbow with that and the mind is still looking <laughs> this is great now <laughs> what's next <laughs> what else can I add and then and just by that feeling of thinking you can add something else that's that should be a clue that that's the ego at work As we move along and, and we go keep going into this and people seem to be attractive and come and join with us, you know, just in the sense of what the world would call community, those are the things that will come up where one person will seem to, to stand out more than the rest and, and be attractive in, in some way or another. And, and, you know, you'll notice it come up and it will obscure the complete equality of the sonship and it will always obscure the true identity and until it's completely transcended it will always seem very attractive at times intensely attractive that what you're describing is kind of like the jewel the, the jewel in the ego's crown <laughs> there's a book the Aquarian Gospel Jesus the Christ and he goes through all these temptations when he's in Egypt and he gets to number six I believe and, and there it's described as the angel idol where this woman of entrancing beauty comes to Jesus as he's sitting there in contemplation and she comes in she doesn't even say a word just sits down and starts to play and sing songs of Israel, you know, some of the songs of his upbringing and of his life, the most beautiful songs of the land, she just sings, and then she just gets up and she leaves, not even a word is spoken, and the way it's described in there is, you know, Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the passions and whatever were stirred, and what ensued was she would come back periodically and it was a, a very much a period of unrest for Jesus and very much a, a temptation and after all these other temptations deceit and different things you know it's like here here is this and and I don't and there it says it was like a 40 again a 40 day it seems to be this number that <laughs> seems to come up for 40 days you know was he tempted and then he he arose and said you know am I to be the demonstration of unconditional love, this love, divine love that comes, you know, not from this world. And he said, he arose and and talked to her, and you know, said that their paths would cross, but that he had to go on and do what he had to do. And and those are the kind of things that you know, as I was going on my journey, you know, when I came across that in the book, and I was working with the course, and and other things, you know, it was like it all started to come together, like, oh yeah, I can see where trying to bring it down to a personal kind of love. You can't have impersonal love and personal love. They can't, they can't go together. And that was just a great little story, a little parable on <laughs> the temptations of, hmm, maybe, well, no. <laughs> you know, eventually when you follow it in, when you really follow it in and you come to your right mind, so to speak, you see that they don't, they can't go together and you can't mix them. But that's, that's always been a real helpful story. If you think about that yearning too, it, in terms of, like you said, a distorted miracle impulse, it, in one sense it gives you a just a sense of the power of love or the power of the miracle just by the strength of it except it seems to be coming through the lens and being perceived as a lack but you can imagine the strength of it without the lens if when it comes through the ego's lens as a distorted miracle impulse 
you know, it's, it's an intense yearning. But when it comes, when you are able to lay aside the ego and it just comes straight into consciousness without going through the ego's lens, it's, it's quite powerful. And I would say, it, it, if I had to describe it, it's, it's kind of like the other day, I'm, or yesterday I was mentioning our friend Mary who's feeling this enormous urge to extend and feeling kind of like she's going to explode or she's feeling like she's it's hard to stifle it because once you really go with it for a while then that's what it is it's just this tremendous urge to extend and be of help kind of like in uh, in the movie Groundhog Day when Phil goes through all these things over and over tries to manipulate people get this woman in bed Rita and do this do that finally he gets this just this uncontrollable urge to be helpful and he's going around fixing tires on cars and catching a child as he falls from the tree every day at the same time and and you know help doing the Heimlich maneuver or helping this guy who's choking you know just it's like he's just looking everywhere to find oh another place I can help <laughs> you know it's like an uncontrollable urge and that's what gets him out of the loop you know, the loop of linear time, of, of time where it just seems like to repeat, which is what linear time is like, just repeating the past over and over and over. And that's what makes, you know, Groundhog Day such a powerful metaphor is because not only can you see the loop, which is real symbolic of the loop that everyone has experienced on Earth, but you also see a metaphor of the way out of the loop. And that's just to be totally helpful, to put completely lose yourself in that urge to be truly helpful. And, that, and that's intense. You, you will experience that. No doubt about it. I'm having just, you know, thoughts or wanting to get clear about expectations and what I was getting in meditation was, you know, that to, to have expectations of anyone based on what they've said in the past is just going to hurt, you know, that I can't trust I can't trust really what anyone says. I can only trust who they are. You know, I can only trust the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit in them. And I can't trust anything in form related to them or have expectations. If we look at expectations, the mind, the deceived mind, has a very, very deep-rooted belief in scarcity and lack, and unworthiness, guilt, and that's what the special relationships of the world, all of these, perceiving oneself as a person and perceiving your brothers as persons, bodies, that's all set up to solve the problem of guilt. In other words, the world was made to solve the problem of guilt. The world was made to solve the problem of lack. The world was made to solve the problem of scarcity. It was the whole belief that one can make it in the world or adapt and adjust to the world and have fulfillment and completion in that adjustment is erroneous. And the expectations are always, if you really trace them down, there's still a belief in incompletion or a belief in lack that has to still be there in the mind. Why would, why would it be important what somebody else said? Why would it be important what somebody else did? Why would anything in the world be important for that matter if one had a real sense of completion, one's own completion of mind? So the lack and the incompletion is what has to be questioned. Those who see themselves as whole make no demands. It's a great line from the Course.